Hi everyone. I'm glad you're here to join us today. It is the session titled Two Crises, a Virus and Labor. But before we begin, I'm going to do a land acknowledgement for this session and I will do that now. Um, my custom is to have people be as comfortable as they can when I'm doing a land acknowledgement. So sit, stand or lay as comfortably as you can. And if you'd be so kind in joining me with three deep breaths so that you can ground yourself in the here and the now. And the first one is. Okay, we'd like to start by acknowledging the land on which we are gathered here today and by acknowledging caretakers of this land. This is the land and treaty land of the Mississaugas of the First Credit First Nation and the ancestral and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. Ojibwe, Chippewas, Huron Wendat Nations. As we think through relationships, it is critical that we also acknowledge Canada's settler colonial history and present and our positions on this land. I just want to check in around sound. Can everyone hear me clearly? Wonderful. And so the description that we have here for today's session um, is the session will attempt to discuss the neoliberal organization of the of academic labor and offer a timeline of the mounting crises experienced by universities and education more broadly, of which COVID-19 is only one of the most significant, is one of the most and not one of the most significant, beginning with observations of how COVID-19 has put academic labor and civil liberties within the context of education into further crisis of surveillance technologies, for example, e-proctoring and biometric scans are indiscriminately forced into classrooms. Also under discussion is a closer look at how university and other sites of education extract personal information, biometric data, and unpaid labor from educators, students, and learners who are increasingly subjected to digital and health surveillance without informed consent or refusal as a real option. The university as a site that produces, normalizes, and trades in both the technology and practices that policymakers, police services, and the prison industrial complex rely on to police, curtail, and foreclose Black and Indigenous lives will also be examined. This session also suggests that resistance to anti-Black racism also puts the academy and its normal business in crisis too. Today, you have myself, Lana Jane, and Dr. Ronaldo Walcott, um, and I'm gonna give a little bit of his bio. Dr. Ronaldo Walcott is a professor of Black Diaspora Cultural Studies at the University of Toronto. Ronaldo's research is founded in a philosophical orientation that is concerned with the ways in which coloniality shapes human relations across social and cultural time and focuses on Black cultural politics, histories of colonialism in the Americas, multiculturalism, citizenship, and diaspora, gender, and sexuality, and social, cultural, and public policy. He is the author of Black Life Food, Black Life Post-BLM, and the Struggle for Freedom and Queer Return. He's published many books and articles. And now I'd like to have Dr. Walcott join us. Um, so for everyone attending, we wanna say thank you for joining us. Um, first, Dr. Walcott is going to um, go through and provide us with a full presentation of his thoughts and provide us a bit of a timeline and arc. And then um, we're gonna go into a conversational format and I will also be moderating simultaneously. So Dr. Walcott, please take a look. Thank you, Lana. Um, I wanna also begin by thanking um, Beverly Bain and Min Sukli for organizing us um, both here in Toronto and well beyond Toronto and Okufa 
and the tech folks for offering us the support to get this up and running. And as well, I want to thank the audience who is who is joining us. Um, what I want to do is um, highly personal, even though it's not, which is to say that I want to draw a timeline from the time I entered the academy in 1995 um, until the present. Um, I'm going to use my, my, my a thinly drawn notion of my career to map that. And, but, so I'm largely speaking to people who are tenure, tenure track um, in terms of my observations here today um, around academic labor. That is not to say that I am not from the school of thought that all academic labor is not what we do in the classroom and research. That in fact, um, that the people who serve us our food, the people who clean our offices in other parts of the university, um, the people who order the supplies, that they're all part of the academic labor force and that we have to be attentive to those people as well. Um, but today I wanna to focus on, what I, on how I see the university as a particularly important and central node in the unfolding of the contemporary crises that shape our lives. So 2020 marks um, one of the most significant crises that I have experienced since entering the university in 1995 as a tenure track professor. And of course, with COVID-19, um, someone like myself had hoped that COVID would have provided us the opportunity to begin to rethink our labor as scholars and academics. Instead, something else happened. Um, what, what, what happened by and large was an attempt to accommodate um, a particular story of the university. And that story was a story that often happens in very locally at the level of departments at the level of programs. We don't want our students to, to be left behind. We don't want our students to experience anything more than they need to experience. So we come together in ways to try to prohibit um, more negative experiences than the period is throwing up for us. But in doing so, what we fail to do is to have a steady and concerted effort to rethink what academic labor might mean. And, and because we haven't done that, um, and because we haven't taken the time to do that in, 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 in a really um, studied way, um, we find ourselves now with a bunch of really confusing messages about um, what our labor should look like in the era of a pandemic. But we also find ourselves um, in a bunch of confusing moments as well concerning what our labor might look like in the context of ongoing resistance to state violence. And so it seems to me that academics, especially academics, I would argue in the humanities, the social sciences, medicine and health, have a particular kind of important role to play in the unraveling of a culture that continually cements itself through logics and practices of violence. So for me to have arrived where I just, where, where I'm at, I need to do a walk back. So bear with me as I do a walk back beginning with, and, and this is a 25 year period in which as an observer of higher ed academic life and labor, um, I've paid witness to the accretion and the sedimentation of the neoliberal project and how it shapes our work and what it is we can't and can't do. Um, even though many of us, many black people like myself, went into the academy, understanding the academy, as one site of struggle, um, one site of struggle that had to be transformed. Instead, what we find ourselves often, um, even against our better judgment and everything that we might um, really strongly believe in politically, we find ourselves deeply implicated in the reproduction of the neoliberal university. You probably will not hear me use that word neoliberal again though, in terms of what it is I want to articulate. So 1995, I'm first, I have my first tenure track job at York University and two things happened in that moment. 
in that moment in the province of Ontario, we are coming out of the tail end of an NDP Bob Ray led government and beginning um, and beginning with um, a deeply conservative far right Mike Harris conservative government. But we're also in the midst of a national restructuring in the first term of the John Cretan Paul Martin government of 1993 to 1997. So the, 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 the massive restructuring of the Cretan Martin years alongside the Mike Harris years began to restructure and recreate um, and recreate what post-secondary education might look like both in this province and across this country. By 1997 at York University, um, we go on strike. At that time, it becomes the longest faculty strike in an English speaking university in Canada. We we're out for almost three months. And while we were out on strike for many different kinds of reasons, one of the, one of the reasons that emerged in that strike was around ownership of what was then developing as online teaching. So one of the issues that came to the fore of that strike was whether or not faculty members designing online courses would own the copyright to those courses, whether once those courses were designed, could those courses then be simply passed on to other faculty and so on as a kind of template for how, and of course, um, in the settlement of that strike, um, faculty members were able to retain the scholarly material in the production of those courses. One of the things that's really important for me in articulating this timeline is that out of that strike, as someone who had just left graduate school two years prior, um, it became absolutely imperative to me that I, I realized that I had to understand the nature of higher academic labor. So I became deeply involved with the faculty union and became the secretary of the union at that point in time. And of course, in those days, the distinction was between tenured and untenured people. And, you know, of course, some of my tenured colleagues felt that an untenured person should not be that involved in, in the union. But I felt it was absolutely necessary to be involved in the union. I'd come from a radical graduate school and I've never been one of these people who was fearful to speak my mind in relationship to politics. Um, policy, action, and so on. And, and indeed, maybe at some point we can talk about how um, this divide of the tenured and the untenured is a disciplinary divide meant to shut down resistance, but maybe we'll get back to that. It was really interesting and important to serve on, on, a, on the academic union executive because I got to learn a lot about um, the nature of the ways in which academic unions actually function to run the university hand in hand with the senior administration. That these are not necessarily two opposing sides within the institution, but rather these are two sides that are seeking to mark out the ways in which they can continue to produce and perpetuate a particular logic of the institution. And, and, and I'll say, say, say that because um, when I transitioned out of being secretary of, of the faculty union at York University. The next admin position that I found myself in was being the affirmative action director <laughs> um, for faculty recruitments. Now, it so happened that that was also the year that all of the equity seeking groups were added to the federal contractors program. So prior to, to that, um, affirmative action was only based upon gender which is part of the story of how many white women were able to enter the university, especially the humanities and the social sciences and continue to be able to move through the institution. But by, by the end of the 1990s, 1999 um, or so, 1998, 1999, the fellow contractors program had, had, had articulated that all equity seeking groups that would be LGBT, uh, people with disabilities, indigenous people, they, they were called Aboriginal at the time, and, and racialized people. As, a, as the affirmative action director at York University, 
one of the first things I, I learned and had to come to terms with that it didn't matter how good policy or how excellent policy any particular university had, that what happened very locally in departments had a really big impact on how that policy would play out across the institution, across the university. So what I saw as for, for one and a half years or so of being the affirmative action director was the ways in which departments would undermine that policy and thereby reproduce whiteness. That all of the pe non-white people who applied for jobs would be deemed not qualified, therefore not having to be shortlist, therefore having not to be a problem for the department if they didn't get the job, and therefore continually producing white departments. At the same time that I was doing that work, across, the, across Canada, there was a massive debate about something that was called then the brain drain. And the, the logic was that um, Canadians, largely imagined as white, were not being hired in Canada's major institutions, especially universities, and they were leaving and particularly going to the US. The claim about the brain drain was happening at the same time that Canadian universities were arguing that they were going to internationalize and globalize. And so one of the things that came out of the brain drain was the now well-established Canada Research Chairs Program around the late 1990s, 2000. So I think 2000 was the first time that um, chairs were announced. And of course, as the Affirmative Action Director at York, I got to sit on York University's first, I got to sit on York University's first CRC Chaired selection committee. I was there as affirmative director to oversee that affirmative action was being um, taken seriously. Of course, um, the qualifications um, that were required for those first chairs meant that all of the chairs went to white people. There were no non-white people who had the qualifications necessary to become candidate research chairs in the first round. I mean, shortly after, shortly after that 2000 period, I found myself leaving York and, and arriving at U of T, holding one of those chairs myself. Um, so part of what I'm trying to narrate here is, is a story about my own career trajectory that has not been a terrible one, but enfolded in it is a particular kind of logic. So we get these chairs, kind of research chairs that were a, a, an attempt to stem the brain drain to the US. At the same time that the universities are claiming that they wanted to internationalize, they want to globalize. And importantly, I would argue at the same time that Canadian universities under the rubric of globalization and internationalization were actually Americanizing. And, and in some ways, if you look at that period, you can see the profound Americanization as it happened at U University of Toronto, as it happened at U of A, as it happened at UBC, and as it happened at McMaster and a number of other, number of other places, that they stand out in my mind as, some, as exemplary of that period of Americanization. Now, let me step back and say that often in the Canadian context, when we talk about the Americanization of the Canadian Academy, that people think that one is being nationalist. As a Black diaspora scholar, I'm not interested in nationalization, but I am interested in the structures that hail us and pull us into reproducing them and replicating them. And so one of the things that happened simultaneously with the Americanization of the Canadian Academy um, is that it also was able to perpetuate its whiteness and to perpetuate his whiteness in very particular kinds of ways. So it's only now by 2018, 2019, 2020 that we begin to start to talk about black studies programs, minors and majors, um, minors and majors in, in, the, in the Canadian higher education. Prior to that, the discourse around black studies, departments, programs went missing. And part of that had to do with a very specific kind of Americanization of Canadian higher education.
Now the CRC program had a very particular kind of effect on higher education. So if the Canadian, if the CRC program was to stop the brain drain, what the CRC program brought along with it was a range of other kinds of research chairs. And this is outside what already existed as endowed chairs. Now, if you look at any Canadian university, you have your CRC program, you have your endowed chairs, and then you've got all of these other kinds of chairs, research type chairs. And, uh, and what comes along with all those types of chairs is a particular pecking order, a particular kind of star system, um, a, a new and a different kind of ecology of how scholarship departments, programs are evaluated, are made sense of, and what becomes important in terms of measuring someone's scholarly success. So the CRC helped to usher in an entirely new ecology in, that became that helped Canadian universities to look more and more, while claiming to be public institutions, to look more and more like US institutions, but also very particular kinds of US institutions became the model and, and the example of what we should achieve. And if part of my argument that that model and that example is rooted in anti-Blackness, and and I will I will when I get to a little bit of a case study, well, I'll I'll say something more about that. Also in 2001, just after the Canada Research Chairs program becomes a program that is repeatable and it's clear that the federal government is going to continue to intervene in education in this way through these specialized chairs and through these pockets of money that are meant to tie higher education to GDP, globalization, and 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 particular kinds of economic indicators and outcomes. At that very same moment, we get 2001, we get, we get the attacks on the US and we get the war on Iraq. And the war on Iraq um, in particular returns us to another moment that is crucial to understanding the role that the university plays in the discourses of state violence. Because the war on Iraq allowed the university in a number of different ways to re-engage the culture war from the perspective of claiming to make sense of Islam, the Middle East, and so on. And by doing that, it was able to also engage in a certain kind of ideological and political targeting of communities within their midst who were seen to be representative of the Middle East, Iraq, Islam, and so on. All of these developments taken together true shifts and changes in language. As I said earlier, when I began teaching in 1995, the great divide was between those who were tenured and those who were untenured. By the end of the 1990s with the Americanization under the rubric of the globalization of the US, uh, but let me repeat that. By the end of the 1990s, under the, under the logic of globalization, but really it was Americanization, we moved from that language to talking about senior and junior. And, and in that language is mapped a certain kind of orientation to how we do academic labor, which is not to say that there are not junior and senior people in the academy, but the ways in which that language gets deployed um, reinforces very particular kinds of relationships. And when I, and when I say that, um, I, I'll return to the CRC program. Most recently, for instance, at the University of Toronto about a year or two ago, um, because the, the CRC program has been so inequitable in terms of awarding white men and white women the chairs and the funding. And, and of course, because women in particular had to bring um, litigation against the CRC program, um, there have been some changes. And one of the changes was that um, adequate equitable representation be um, achieved. Now, of course, one of the ways in which this was dealt with, in particular at my university, was the University of Toronto asked non-white people and, and women to self-nominate themselves for these chairs, um, for these chairs in, in the moment of seeking equity. Um, that tells you something about the particular understanding and relation 
that the university as a node within state violence adds towards non-white people. That when it's asked to account for equitable distribution of resources, it says to those people, we will not even think and work with you. Nominate yourselves and then we will take you up at the level of the technocratic nature of these chairs. So the CRC program rec represents a very particular kind of a very particular kind of reordering of the ecology of the university through its language, um, through the ways in which it privileges what kind of work um, should be supported, and through the ways in which it disciplines scholars to do very particular kinds of research work. Because importantly, when when those applications leave universities and go off to Ottawa or wherever, very few non-white people sit on the expert panels that make the ultimate decisions. But the, the Iraq war was yet another moment of a crisis in which we had to think very carefully about the nature of the work that we do, how our work gets understood, and how our work gets both deployed and used in service of forms of domination and oppression. And 2001, 2002, 2003 was a really difficult time in the university for those of us who are opposed to imperialism, to those of us who understood that whatever was enacted in the Middle East in Iraq would come back to North America and, be, and impact our lives. And of course, as we see Black people taken to the streets in the US and across Canada, and we see the kinds of surveillance technologies that, that, that are unleashed on them, the kinds of paramilitary policing that's unleashed on them, we have indeed seen the return of Iraq and the methods used in Iraq on the streets all across North America. In 2008, we're faced with another crisis and that's the crisis in the market crisis, the crash of the market. And the crash of the market is really interesting in terms of thinking about what forecloses further um, diversification of the academy, especially in relationship to black and indigenous people, because the crash of the market meant that a certain divestment in the areas of knowledge production that black people and indigenous people are currently concentrated in was easily justified. Of course, the crash of the market also shored up and opened up the fetish around endowments at the leading universities in North America, both public and private. And again, I must say that in 2020 and in the midst of COVID, again, we see the fetish of the endowment and the ways in which as my, my friend and colleague, Jamie Lynn Magnuson, has pointed out and the ways in which universities are hedge funds. So that at the level of the department, we come in, we're doing our work, we care about our students, we care about the research that we're doing. There's another aspect of the university in which the hedge fund logic rules and runs everything. And we're only as important as we continue to allow the university to be a global entity in the measurement and evaluation systems that allows it Sorry, let me slow down. And we are only at the local level as important to the university at the level of the evaluative and measurement systems that allows the university to continue to be a part of a global capitalist order. Now set all of that to come to what I think is most important, but I should say most important, but I'm trying to build towards thinking about um, how it is that what we do in the university at the local level matters both to the university as a dominating force and, uh, and, and how we might begin to undo that and what that means. So if you look at any sociology department, you will see a bunch of different kinds of things going on. But one of the things that you will find that's really interesting is that um, colleagues, many colleagues in sociology departments claim to do work of social importance and significance. Um, many a criminology department is attached to a sociology department, even though many of them are now um, separate. Sorry, many a criminology program is attached to a sociology department, even though many criminology departments are now, uh, even though many criminology programs are now their own department. And 
one of the things that, that we begin to notice is that in the areas of criminology, surveillance, policing, tech, and so on, that um, at the low, very local level, we are deeply implicated in the rep reproduction of all kinds of violences, violences that bear down on Black people's everyday lives. And it's, it's in those places where our students are really leading these struggles and these fights. Indeed, it's students who lead against the idea, lead against and push against policing on campus. Very seldom do we find our colleagues in criminology departments, sociology departments, leading the struggle against, against policing on our campuses. Um, in fact, very seldom do they even do research on the cities that they live in. One of the ways in which they, they validate themselves is by standing apart from um, where they're actually located so that the research that they do doesn't have an impact on their very local. These are the ways in which we reproduce the systems of violence within the university. The university itself is a network of violences. In the contemporary university, two kinds of language for doing activism have actually occurred. So we've, we have now scholar activists who are proud of the kind of work that they do. And often these people who are willing to mark themselves as scholar activists are seen as doing left work, work that might go under the shorthand as progressive work and so on. But then we've got this other set of activists who never get called activists who are consultants and advisors to government and business and so on, and who, and who produce and make policy that impacts all of our lives. Sometimes they're sitting just down the corridor from us and they never get marked as activists. In fact, they, their research is seen as contributing to a larger public good. And so one of the things that we are faced with at a very local level is that we actually work to, in the university, we actually work to produce the state actors who authorize our very deaths. They are in our classrooms. We teach them, we train them. This is one of the conundrums that Sylvia Winter has taught us to think with. What we should be clear about this, that we are implicated in helping to replicate and produce students who will go out into the world and become a part of the replication of the very violences that we are trying to undo. I feel like I've gone off a little bit, so I'm going to try to cut to a couple of other things. When I, when I say that we are implicated, I want, to be, I want to be clear that we shouldn't think that activism and the scholar activist only lives in places like women and gender studies, queer studies, ethnic studies, black and black studies, native and indigenous studies, and so on. I want us to reorient ourselves to recognize that the scholar activists who will never call themselves that lives in policy studies, um, lives in medicine, lives in health studies, lives in all of these other kinds of places that, that we notice but we don't focus on. And it's in those other places that the university is accrued in a whole lot of power and a whole lot of exercise of power on our lives and in our local communities and so on. I want to quickly reflect on two other things. One of the ways in which we are now being, um, having our work redirected is to see many of our colleagues take up positions in what is now shorthand called EDI, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, or as advisors to deans and higher ups. And because many of the people who hold these positions are black and indigenous and people of color, we have to be aware that these positions are now being placed in between us as a kind of form of silencing which is to say that we often don't critique the work being done in these offices and in these places because we know the people who are sitting in them. They were our colleagues before, and we know that their hearts and their politics is, is, off, was, is often in the right place. But unfortunately, they've now taken up 
a place in a structure that is meant to reproduce certain kinds of violences. And I give you one example of what I'm, what I'm talking about. I recently was allowed to see a letter that York University sent out about the scholar strike that we're having, asking people to report, asking, asking faculty members and TAs and contract faculty to report to their chair or whomever um, that they were gonna participate in the strike. Now, and the letter was signed by the provost for academics and the provost for EDI. Now, the funny thing is that a strike is a withdrawal of work. <laughs> so asking um, faculty members to report, to participate in a strike is a rather odd thing, but this is the way in which, this is an insidious way in which um, these new offices will come in to manage us and to take away or dilute um, any forms of resistance that we might have, that uh, we might want to engage in. So we have to be really, we have to be really careful um, around how we take up these new positions and what these new positions might mean, because these new positions are meant to manage us and in some ways to curtail our wildest dreams of what the university can and could be. And this brings me, I'm really glad, and my colleague, um, Andrea Davis raised this. Uh, this brings, raised this as well. I'm really glad that Okufa is supporting us in the scholar strike, but Okufa and CAUT and our faculty unions and faculty associations have failed us miserably on the front of anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism in the university. You know, if we were to take Okufa as a national union that's supposed to address our our interest, Akufa itself needs a dose of diversification. For, so, for, for at least 20 years, some of the same figures have been at Akufa claiming to work on our behalf, yet producing almost nothing for us. And I, I don't say this as a way to diminish the importance of Akufa. I believe, I, I wish that my university where I work, that we were a legalized union. But I think that we have to be really honest that, you know, I've watched over a 25 year period where we went from multicultural discourse to anti-racist discourse to now anti-Black and anti-Indigenous discourse. And yet Black and Indigenous people continue to be um, the smallest percentage of those employed. And when it comes to areas like the humanities and the social sciences where, where Black people in particular actually hold doctorates and could be hired tomorrow, if any of our universities were really interested in seriously hiring Black people, um, we know that there are obviously and clearly other, other things at play and at work. So I hold not just um, those in senior administration um, accountable um, for what we are witnessing and the ways in which the university is a principal site of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous violence, I also hold our unions accountable because they themselves replicate the very problem that the senior administrators have given us. So blackness remains shut out through all of these structures into logics of globalization, internationalization, the Americanization of, the, of Canadian higher education. And of course, at the local level, we get disciplined into this. So this is not simply something about me saying that there are a bunch of bad actors out there. At the local level, having been a department chair, I know that if I don't produce, along with my colleagues, the kind of um, shortlist that my senior bosses are looking for, that we might lose a position. So we're disciplined into this. And as we're disciplined into it, we're forced to replicate a politics that is actually not to our best advantage. And that goes all the way through at the local level from hiring committees, tenure, recruitment, and so on. The last point that I want to leave us on here, and then all of this is sewn up with a certain kind of logic of secrecy and confidentiality. I began in 95, but I want to take you back a little bit further. In the mid 1980s, when I was undergraduate student at York University, deans, prospective deans and prospective presidents gave interviews to entire communities, whoever wanted to come. 
In a 25, 30 year period, we have seen that transform where all of these appointments are made through secret headhunting firms. Some people might think that this is a really great move because they don't want to be embarrassed that they applied for a job and they didn't get in and so on. But this in fact replicates the very problems of violence that we seek to undo. That this privacy and confidentiality allows for a particular kind of selection that replicates a norm, a norm of whiteness, a violent norm of whiteness. But it also finds itself being spilled all the way down into how we also live at the very local level. And what that means then is the colleagues behaving badly on hiring committees can be, can be assured that we're not gonna talk about it because of confidentiality. And what that means is that over my 25 years, I've had to sit on hiring committees um, where terrible things have been said about black scholars and others. And I've of course had to fight those things. But that means that you're not going to have any friends. So I'm gonna conclude by saying, one of the things all of us must ask ourselves as we struggle against a university that is a significant player in the replication of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous violences, um, a significant player in showing up the state and the violences that it is able to unleash on all of us is, that we must all sit before ourselves and we must all ask ourselves the question, what price are we willing to pay to change this? We must all ask ourselves, what price are we willing to pay to change this? I've asked myself that, that question and I know what the answer is. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Walcott. I actually wanted to go back to some of the great things that you said, there was so much in there. I in particular appreciate um, the timeline because for those of us that weren't in the academy or um, were just arriving at some of these points, um, we don't have the long view. And interestingly enough, it's not articulated anywhere. So if I actually um, wanted to know like what went down like since like the 1990s, I, the only way I could find out would probably be to actually listen to this talk um, because you actually contextualized all of these really important events and tied them back to the university that we have now versus the one I think that we're often encouraged to imagine. So I wanted to, um, actually poke at your question at the end. So you said, you know, what price are we willing um, to pay? And so I wanted to ask you that question and also tie it into um, that Americanization of the, you know, Canadian University. And so, you know, I myself have been in uh, situations where, you know, you go into the academy and you're looking for Canadian content. We're Canadian and we're raised here and some of, you know, born here. And yet we go in and our professors, you know, are American, that's, that's fine, but they're actually not even teaching Canadian content. And when you ask them about the Canadian content, they, they have no knowledge. They, they can't even tell you where to find it. So I think there's something about the price that we're paying and this kind of economic model, the Americanization that gets embodied in the actual professors that get quote headhunted and recruited and then what shows up as curriculum. So I want you to just talk about the price um, that we are paying um, and how that kind of ties to how the research industrial complex is benefiting off of this moment of COVID where black people uh, that are either in the university or affiliated are using that to leverage it for those um, research settings of endowments and CRCs and collecting data from black communities. Can you talk a bit about that mix of things? Thank you, Lana. Look, I think one of, if, I mean, of course, everything that I said has, is haunted by 68. And I, I think a lot with the theorist Sylvia Winter, because Winter tells us and teaches us so well that 68 really was a moment, 68 and shortly after really was a moment of potential revolution. Mm. And that revolution got interrupted by first by offering white women a spot and then offering black men and, 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 and I would have to probably say black heterosexual men spots as a way of undoing potential revolutionary 
desire, and action in favor of representation. Winter is making this argument in the early 1990s. She's saying, in, the, in the late 80s, early 1990s, she's saying, the revolution got undone by offering us representation instead of democratization. And that representation meant that admitting a small number, a few, in which we would now invest all of our desire, we too could be one of them. And by so doing, it's been able, the, the, it was able to, if you will, mute the revolution. We are living in the mute of the revolution. And what happens on the streets is the attempt to rekindle revolutionary possibility and fewer. The truth of the matter is that as much as our scholar strike is in, is in solidarity with what has broken out on the street and is in solidarity with what even the basketball players attempted to do before Obama interrupted it, we are actually behind. And we are behind because we are a mold, a node of governance for what happens on the street. And it can happen in really small ways. The way in which we penalize our students for not showing up in class, to in the myriad of ways in which we become, as Petero um, likes to say, the police. We become cops. And and I and and so. The question that you're asking me around what this means is that radical spaces in the academy have to refuse. We have to refuse being caught, which means that if you're going to do a particular kind of work, you can't imagine you're going to get the CRC, right? At this particular time. If you're going to do a particular kind of work, you might not even get the job. But the fact of the matter is, at least in the social sciences and the humanities, there are lots of black people with PhDs who don't have jobs, even though they're not doing the kind of radical work that's meant to undo or open up and democratize the university. So we're actually not, sorry. <laughs> so we're actually not losing anything. I come to this from a place of thinking about in the interim, as we, can, as we attempt to get to some place much better. What are the things that we need to do now? And some of the things that we need to do now is to constantly undermine the, 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 the methods and the practices that pull us into replicating the neoliberal university. And that means that we have to take some risks. And that's why I ended by saying we all have to kind of figure out what price we're willing to pay. So um, you said uh, something happens here. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about here? And I want to tie that to the conversation that you were having earlier around how the university not only replicates something, we're in the midst of a deep Americanization as part of a you know, global capital project. But when we talk about here, um, are you talking about the here as in the making of the a, a nation state? Are you talking about here? Like, where is here? Well, I first started talking about something happens here in the context of the work that I do on Black Canadians, in which, because um, there was a way, there was a way that um, Black Canadian life and Black Canadian contributions to intellectual talk could go missing. And again, I, w I really want to buttress this by saying that this is not about a national argument. It's about what does it mean to account for wherever Black people show up. So there's nothing that I do, given the geography and the territory that I'm in called Canada, that I don't account for Black people in this place. Now, the Americanization of higher education in Canada means that um, Black people can go missing. And I've sat on hiring committees where colleagues trained in the US would say things like, oh, that person works on Black Canada. It's too small and too insignificant for a global university. Now, one then has to gather oneself 
and gathered that argument and placed it in a sequence of thought that demonstrates not only that it is racist, anti-Black, and so on, but that it reproduces a very particular kind of story of empire, right? A story of empire in which Black people in Canada can be disappeared in favor of something else. Having said, having said that, we also must be aware that Black people themselves become implicated in the reproduction of these violences that we too behave as though nothing has happened here. So we don't have to cite black scholars who work from this place, right? We can all, as I've said in, in something that I, I, said, I said, we can all write the same essay and everybody will behave as though it's happening for the first time because there does not have to be any history to blackness here. Um, so, you know, one can see um, and read the same essay repeatedly over and over again about, you know, some discovery of something called blackness in Canada. In a bunch of different kinds of ways in the humanities and social sciences, we see this. And, and part of what's at stake there then is what does it mean to nurture and produce thought in the geography that one resides in that's about transforming that geography? That's about recognizing that the ways in which the violence of that geography lays its hands, lays its hands on you is similar but also different. That there's no, these, as a diaspora scholar, I'm opposed to borders, but I understand that borders work to produce particular kinds of practices. Like people think that when you say you do diaspora work, that you're ignoring borders. No, actually you're studying borders. Mm -hmm. You're studying how borders shut you down. You're studying how borders are an attempt to break you into pieces and break you apart so that you can't make commonality with others. And, and, and that's in part what's at stake. So let me put this really clear to you. At the very local level of departments, you see a certain kind of Americanization play itself out a white Americanization, I want to add, mm. that is intent on disappearing Blackness. So it's not to say that there is an anti-Black racism already present in Canada from the very time of its conception, but it's to say that that gets compounded with a particular kind of American and US in anti-Blackness. Mm. And when that's compounded in schools like U of A, like the University of Toronto, like McGill, and so on and so on. What we get is a context of pedagogical and educational violence that is significantly, significantly severe for Black people and Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want to come back to a piece you talked about, the different types of scholar activists. So um, the lobbyist has that rests, nurtures itself, and is funded by the academy, always has disappeared, right? So we're always meant to think, especially in the sciences and in the health sciences and in the uh, chemistry, biochemistry, engineering, computer science, that there are no scholar activists. Um, but I've met some of the most fervent and forward-pushing um, activists who are in those faculties, and they're not of the kind of activist language that we would think, but they're, you know, they're professing a particular kind of um, economic efficiency that excludes people and, you know, clusters power in certain areas, and they're often doing the work of large corporations. Um, and I mean, we can even see that in the Americanization of the Canadian institution with actually having the name <laughs> of the institution that was part of our colonization um, on the chair, right? The, the XY bank, the ABC hedge fund, the tech company, the very people that are in court for civil rights and human rights violations um, are literally the ones funding um, parts of the academy, especially quote, the more progressive parts, and they're not identified as scholar activists. In fact, they are lobbyists who should actually have to you know, sign in, but they are a type of scholar activist. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how that also kind of distorts um, what can be imagined, right? So if we have a lobbyists, you know, who are actually academics, um, who are coming through a framework that is the Canadian university that has transformed itself 
um, as much as it can into an American embodiment um, that is not going to value Canadian scholarship. Um, and we know that there's a huge military project going on in our midst, right, through our police services. Can we talk a little bit more about how that those police services come into the classroom through surveillance? And I'm thinking now about a call that um, I got over the summer. Um, and because I look at AI, and particularly in clinical care, uh, the person thought it was important for medical schools and had emailed me and said, can you look into this? Because there's this um, e-proctoring thing that's on the rise because of COVID producing more online classrooms and exams. And when I looked at it, so e-proctoring is if you're taking a course and there is a test, or it could also just not be a test or an exam, uh, they may ask a student to turn their camera on so that they can uh, verify them. Sometimes you're asked to actually use a camera to scan your entire space. And so if it's your home, it may be your bedroom. If the bathroom is the only place you're gonna get quiet, it might be that. But you're actually being asked to let a surveillance company who may or may not actually be under the auspices of the university, and in most of these contracts, they're not, to take footage of yourself offering a biometric print and an entire layout of your space to quote, verify and police you to make sure that A or B or C is happening. Um, in, the, in the natural world, what would happen is you'd go into an exam hall, there'd be a physical person, you'd have your utensils that you're permitted, you'd go sit down, they would walk up and down and, and watch the space. Um, and they could then interpret what they saw. Um, what these e-proctoring technologies do in fact is um, the camera must read your space and distinguish between your face and other objects. It has to distinguish between noises that it thinks are odd from noises that are part of quote, the environment of the exam. And I bring this up because I'm thinking about some of the universities, the criminology departments, the policy departments, the business departments, that are actually incubating these companies or had in the in the past. And now professors like yourself, students, are having to go into these contexts where the same kind of technology that, for instance, the Toronto Police Services just purchased is now part of your educational experience through e-proctoring. And somehow that's meant to fly under the radar. So can you talk a little bit about um, how that erodes um, civil liberties, but also how it puts the university, as we described in the in the abstract, into crisis and and brings us into questioning a different kind of project that you're suggesting. Look, Lana, first, you're the expert on this, so um, I, I hope that you will pick up where I can't go. I mean, I think, and again, like I said, COVID offered us the opportunity to rethink our labor. Instead, what is happening is that we're all being made cops. Mm -hmm. I'm using the idea of cops broadly, mm -hmm. right? We're all now being ushered into an era of surveilling each other. Mm -hmm. Even at the level of public health, the way in which we're talking about how to deal with our colleagues or our neighbors and so on, they're making cops of us. Mm -hmm. You see more than six people, call the bylaw officer. Now we're being told as professors, that we should somehow surveil the layout of students' homes so that they might not cheat on an exam. How about let's not do exams? How about let's have a year of meeting over whatever platform we have to meet over, thinking, talking, laughing as much as we can in these times and learning together without the consequence of grades. But we didn't get the chance to do that. Instead, what we got the chance was to utilize and deploy forms of technology that allow us to surveil each other. This, now, I mean, in that timeline that I gave you, I could have given you the crisis moment at OSD University of Toronto in 2002, 2003, when we found out that some of our colleagues were in psychology, we're testing um, military game virtual reality um, equipment. I could have talked about the numerous flare-ups at the University of Toronto around um, researchers there taking grants and doing research for the military industrial complex in the USA. 
what I'm saying to you is that the university has continually been a site of the replication of these violences and these practices and these technologies that COVID have now centered in all of our lives. So some of our colleagues are developing these technologies and deploying them. And some of us now are, are, are to deploy them as an implement of our everyday work. This is a part of how we get pulled into these violences. None of us are outside of these violences. Part of what we're dealing with now in terms of our own academic labor is that as much as we're having a strike about anti-Black violence, we're going to now be asked to deploy technologies in our everyday world that are news as technologies of violence in the communities where we live, where our students live, where our family members live, right? The same kind of surveillance technology that allows us to map what's going on in the student's room is the same kind of surveillance technology that's on the street lamp at Jane and Finch, right? And so the kind of the question then becomes, what do we do in the university to unmake these practices? And we're gonna have to risk something. We're gonna have to risk something. And I want all of us to sit with what it is we're willing to risk to make sure that this is not perpetuated because we needed to have this conversation on March 1 when we realized that we weren't going to be able to meet, we need to have this conversation on March 1. We are now, we have now found ourselves on September 10th in the belly of the surveillance beast. And none of us are outside of it. We can try to find ways to circumvent it, but we have landed in the belly of the beast because we were not able to have a fulsome conversation about the nature of what academic labor might be. Instead, we fell into, and I know I'm generalizing, but we fell into the care model. Mm. Well, I want the students to get their degree. Well, I want the students, I don't want the students to be affected in this way. I don't want, we fell into the care model of our work in a way that actually turns out not to be healthy and to be politically damaging, probably in the long run. Um, I wanted to, you know, remind people to really think about, well, what are you willing to risk? Um, I also want to talk about this piece around unmaking practices and dual use technologies and how as um, uh, professors and people engaged in the university, we are part or in the belly of the surveillance beast. Um, you know, you offered that why not forego um, grades, but that doesn't forego evaluation. There is the pass fail model that is used in many professional schools and actually is the way in which you're evaluated for most of your technical skills because there is a vast variance of how you can perform something and you're actually just looking for core competencies that doesn't require a particular kind of testing model of grades. You can still ensure quote academic rigor um, which many people would be alarmed at if grades were thrown out but there's another thing on offer there's a pass fail there is still a method that is commonly used in graduate school to say you know this this learner was present, they engaged, they submitted their content, and they have some competency in or, or knowledge um, about this particular area. So there is something else on offer. So there, there is a real viable offer where um, we can actually push back collectively as students and as professors and as uh, broader administrators to saying no to being in the belly of the surveillance beast in the um, in the classroom environment. And I think that's important because when I got that email and somebody said, can you look into this? It seems, and when my colleague and myself did look into it technically and technologically, and also in terms of the implications um, to civil liberties and legally, it was very frightening. So um, just a quick piece here, cause you said I could add some, is that it's difficult to unmake a university when you're actually being biometrically scanned um, you're being um, captured in video, being stored on a server that you don't know where, being sold and packaged to who knows what. Um, none of the universities were able to tell us um, or show their contracts. So when, you know, the answer is, I don't know what happens. When the professor says, I don't know what happens to that data. I don't know where it's stored. I, okay, can you just forward the, um, the agreement, which, you know, has the student implicated. So 
the student should be able to see the agreement, um, there's no ability to do that. And for folks that are out there, um, one of the things that were asked of us was to open it up. So we are actually gonna run um, a, a full study. So all those students and professors who are interested and concerned about the technologies in their classroom, there'll be an opportunity to actually inv investigate it. Um, and so I wanted to you know, encourage people to think about it. This is a, a labor action, that this is about um, unmaking a particular set of violent practices that produce anti-Black racism. One of the most powerful things at our fingertips is refusing the surveillance because yes, I'm gonna give you a great text study of it. Um, you know, students have already said they want it and investigated. They wanna run the trial. They wanna find out exactly what's going on at their university. Um, but wouldn't it be great if the report is produced, but there's no need to go any further because everyone has said no to surveillance in the classroom, thereby taking away the power from the administration to make the decision for us. Because I think that was my concern in the follow-up conversations was, so is your expectation, because knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation, the research language, you know, what do you want to do with this information once it's provided? Oh, we want to, and I said, so you're going to ask the people who didn't ask you to stop doing something no one invited them to do. And I think that this piece of unmaking, I want to hear you talk about a bit. Yeah, well, I think what you pose, Lana, strikes me in two kinds of ways. One of the, one of the things is that we, we begin to see where the, ethic, the ethical review as a governing practice in the university stops in certain places, mm -hmm. right? And it definitely stops at the place where the senior managers have decided that this is the technology we're going to use and this is how we're going to use it. Now, you know, because we know that, 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 that many of the universities that we work at are actually hedge funds, I wonder how many of these universities that we work at know whether or not they've got money invested in these very technologies. These are all of the kinds of questions that we've not been able to ask and to grapple with because, again, we so quickly turn to the care model of, I want to get my students through, I want to make sure that, you know, which is not bad because what it is, what the university has been able to accomplish in its remaking is to have us at the very local level in our departments, or our units, our programs. We seek to care for each other at that local level. And, and as an attempt to do less harm at that local level, we then engage in these practices that when we telescope out, we realize, wow, this is really dangerous, right? So one is not going to say, well, to uh, a new colleague on the tenure track, ah, oh, just publish your book wherever, because we know that comes as a consequence, right? So one can't be as dismissive. What we've not done at the very local level is organize well enough to push back against these practices. What we've not done at the local level is have enough bodies, enough people to organize with us to push back against these practices. So for instance, the one indigenous colleague in a department or the one black colleague in a department can often not find enough people to push back to change the course of the department's curriculum offerings so that other indigenous and black people can be hired. Now throughout my career, I've been really fortunate to work in departments with significant numbers of non-white people so that you know, there's been a certain kind of insulation from, from certain kinds of questions. But on other questions, there have been troubles too. So I don't wanna, part of what I'm trying to get at here is the ways in which, now I'm gonna use the word again, the ways in which the neoliberal university has disciplined us, has also impacted black, brown and indigenous people too. Which is to say that we become some of its best spokespeople for these terrible practices, right? We've got black professors running around this country talking about the collection of race-based data. But when public health departments put out race-based data on COVID and pinpointed the neighborhoods where black people and brown people and poor people are still being infected and being harmed by COVID, those same professors were not seen in the news mm -hmm. saying, send rapid testing to those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. 
send 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 um medical outpatient services to these neighborhoods. So what we see is that the professional research class of which I am a part, right? I'm not reading myself out of this, of which I'm a part, even though I don't do that kind of research because I would not support my people like that. Mm -hmm. But the professional research class has at heart a different interest. There's something else at stake for them okay. than the communities, than the front care, than the, than the healthcare worker on the front line who wants the, the resources shifted right now. The healthcare work on the front line wants the resources shifted right now to deal with COVID. These professional researchers want to go and do a research study. Why? Because it's going to accrue for them inside the university. It doesn't have anything with saving lives down the street. Mm -hmm. Now, to have this kind of conversation, people say, well, you're attacking a person personally. But we need to have these conversations if we're going to understand the role that the contemporary university plays in the unrolling of the violences that shape our lives every single day. When you've got colleagues in education departments who are in the back rooms advising politicians on higher education policy, on policy for elementary schools, on policy for high schools, you cannot tell me that they're not a part of the network of state violences. Mm -hmm. When you've got colleagues who are moving between senior management and then out to private and then back to senior management in universities, you can't tell me that they're not a part of the violences that are impacting Black people's lives and Indigenous people's lives and poor people's lives. So if we don't begin to understand the university as a significant site of struggle around labor and the kind of labor that we can do and how that labor gets taken up and redeployed and how at the local level, our attempt to manage what we think is harm is helping to replicate that and that we need a new model, we need new forms of resistance. Then we find ourselves really stuck in this death drive because this is, this is where this, all of this is taking us, towards a death drive of which, of course, Black and Indigenous people's deaths are going to be the worst, the most significant, the most difficult. I've already written about how it is the Black people die differently from other people, even when we have the same illness, right? So, you know, white, white gay men see the end game for HIV, and HIV is still an epidemic for Black people. Everywhere in the world, HIV is still an epidemic for Black people. I can see a similar kind of thing where, you know, mm -hmm. folks will be saying, okay, COVID is over for us and COVID is still an epidemic for black people, for indigenous people. I and we have, to be, we have to be aware of how these things and the role that the university plays, right? Because we know a lot of university folks made a lot of money and, 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 and a lot of stellar careers have been made out of studying HIV among black people in Canada. Mm -hmm. But HIV is still an epidemic among Black people in Canada. A lot of people will make a lot of strong and wonderful careers in the academy out of studying race-based that and COVID. Mm -hmm. But Black people will still be suffering from COVID. Mm -hmm. I want to jump in there. Um, I want to take up some of the questions in the chat, or comments, rather. And so there's a question here with around, like, there's, a, there's someone who's saying, um, I'm enrolled in a course, and that course is still happening today. Um, what do you think about what's going on this moment? So there's a, uh, an opportunity to be in solidarity with people who are pushing back against anti-Black racism and still some of your peers, some of the professors out there are deciding to just teach over it and um, whatever. Um, and so this individual is asking, you know, what are your thoughts about um, the pressures right now? Um, for folks that are both in the solidarity and who are outside. And the other one I want to roll in at the same time is, what do you think some of the alternative structures of organizing can be to push this possible unmaking or these other possibilities? So I don't know if you can put those two things together. Mm -hmm. Look, I'm not surprised to hear that there, that there are people teaching. I'm not surprised to hear that there might be Black and Indigenous people teaching. We, we, we must be clear, and I don't know where this myth of the university comes from, that the university is this radical, democratic, open place. The university is a deeply, deeply fraught and extremely conservative place, and has been, always has been, right? I mean, part of the anti-Black violences, that, which one I'm trying to say, part of the anti-Black violences 
and indigenous violences that we must struggle against have, have been produced as knowledge forms within the university. It's why some of us entered the university to challenge those knowledge forms, to challenge those colleagues down the corridor who are producing all kinds of nonsense about black people and indigenous people and, 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 and other marginalized people. So of course, I am not surprised um, that folks would still be teaching. I mean, some of us by the project of ongoing intensification of capital and white supremacy as a way of experiencing the world that we live in. Some of us know that that intensification is a death drive and we're going to resist it because we think there's something worthwhile in saving the planet and all of the species that live on this planet, right? So we're gonna push against that. I think that, you know, the question is one of taking risks. And I don't wanna be flippant by saying, you do A, you do B, you do C, because I think this is a collective project. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we have, been, we have been pushed into a corner. So at the local level, we collectively, even when we don't use that language, come together to make sure we do no harm, that we save a colleague's tenure, that we, you know, but we haven't done the same kind of work, the same level of work to say, okay, we're gonna save the colleague's tenure, but we're not gonna save it this way. Mm -hmm. And I've been around the university long enough. I've sat on enough tenure committees. I've sat on tenure committees where, you know, presidents sent back the file, required more information and so on. And when they do that, our response is to seize uh, and give them what they want. And we've got to collectively figure out together how we don't do that anymore. We've got to collectively figure out together how we're going to say no to being the advisor. We've got to collectively figure out together how we're going to say EDI has ran its course. We've got to collectively figure out together how we're going to say your version of globalization is not the version of globalization that we need. Mm -hmm. Because we're not saying that we're anti-globalization. We're saying that your version of globalization is not the version that we need. I have sat in, in university meetings where research vice presidents roll out plans for recruiting students among the world, from around the world. And Africa and the Caribbean never shows up. And when you raise your hand and you ask a question why, we are understood to be charity. So we're told, well, we're developing a model where we can give some scholarships. Uh, of course, with the corrupt bourgeoisie and Africa and the Caribbean has enough money to send their kids to school in North America at the 15,000 a year rate too, but none, nonetheless. But, but I want to um, jump in there. I want to jump in there. I think that's an important point because what it also tells us is about who gets to be in those classrooms and who can be part of that imagining. So if we're talking about anti-Blackness and I've seen it with my own two eyes and the, and, and the kind of Black that Canada is selecting for is a particular kind of affluent conservative black that in fact often, you know, like many other um, folks that Canada skims off the top have their money as a result of being cooperative with the colonizing and global markets of capital and, um, action, and movement of resources. So like, what does it mean when that kind of recruitment plan only has space for the, for the black version of white affluence to come in and what does it mean when you, we are in classrooms where we don't actually have a representative black population? What we have is a curated black elite who are just there to get their brand to continue on their capitalistic ways. And so I think that that distorts what's possible in imagining and we have to actually crack that open too. Um, I have challenged some of those um, people and I've said, oh, I think it's really interesting. So like, what did this cost you, right? And so what might that mean for how you might try to rethink solidarity because this isn't for free, right? I, you know, having grown up and had to push back and try to create space that just get an education and not be pushed out of the classroom. It's important that, you know, anti-blackness doesn't get fostered um, within our own communities that are able to squeeze into the few spots 
especially if they're not recruiting a broad diversity of students. It means that they're actually performing another violence and they're using other black people to counsel out any possible imaginings, which ties to a question here um, that one of the folks submitted that said, you know, how do you deal with the anxiety of not getting tenure? Um, how do you deal with the radical versus not radical enough? And I think a number of these questions are actually querying, you know, how do you, how do you deal with yourself? Like, how do you support yourself through this so that you can actually do what has to be done? Um, I think you shared the answer. It's around collective thinking versus simply individuals. But can you go a little I, further into that? Yeah, if I, if I go back to, so I began in 95. I'm a graduate student between 1990 and 1995. Mm -hmm. and, and if I was to plot the languages that were used at that time, and, and this is not to obscure power, mm -hmm. but at the place where I did my graduate training, where I, 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 I was teaching until this year, OISE, we didn't use the language of training mm -hmm. to talk about graduate studies in the first instance. We were studying together. Right? And studying together meant that knowledge and its deployment was a political project. And we obviously had different kinds of political projects. And part of that was that when one became um, a tenure track professor, that one was attempting to deploy that political project of knowledge in the attempt to do something. So what that meant was that my graduate studies did not produce in me a notion of fair and tenure. What it produced in me was that academic labor is a particular kind of labor. Mm -hmm. And it is very not possible that I could do that labor on the tenure track for five or six years or seven years mm -hmm. and not get tenure. Does that then no longer mean that I'm not a thinker? that I'm not an intellectual, no. I go on and I do something else. Mm -hmm. what, we've, what, what I've seen in my 25 years as a professor is that increasingly people are now trained to live in fear of not getting tenure. Mm -hmm. And because they live in fear of not getting tenure, mm -hmm. they can be manipulated mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways or they can come to believe things mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways. In fact, sometimes they come to believe things that are even harmful to them, right? So again, not to be flippant because here I am 25 years later, I'm a full professor and all that, mm -hmm. but I've never played those games, which is to say that one has to be aware of what, one is, what price one is willing to pay. Again, I want to stress that there are so many, I'm speaking now specifically to Black people, there are so many Black people just in Canada alone with PhDs in the humanities and social sciences who do not have full-time jobs in the academy who are still intellectuals and thinkers. They're not any less than those of us, any less than those of us who've actually been able to maintain jobs and have tenure. In fact, we might be more docile than them. You know, there's a wing which we've been able to fashion ourselves. There's a wing which we've been able to participate in the normative running of the academy in which we have not necessarily been as big a threat as some of them might have been perceived. Of course, I'm generalizing again, but what I'm trying to get at here is that the production of fear is also about re the replication of the violences that we seek to stop, that we seek to bring to an end. And we have, to, we have to really understand that language maps that. When we talk about training, when you talk about disciplining, all of that is the language that cements these fears and then cements you reproducing these violences and replicating these violences. And so we've got to begin at the level of language, at the level of culture. You know, when I was a graduate student, and I guess when you get old, you start talking about when you were, but when I was a graduate student, 
of course, there were, there were jealousies among students. And of course, we talked about whether or not a particular professor liked this particular student's work better and so on and so forth. But the sense of, of a certain kind of parental relation was not the force of those relationships. Now that's what we see. And we see calls for these kinds of parental relationships. But actually graduate students are adults. We're adults in a relationship of knowledge exchange. And of, I'm of course saying that these things the way that I'm saying them is not an attempt to obscure power. Any student who studies with me at the individual level knows that I'm gonna say, I'm the professor, you're the student, I'm responsible up to here. But at the same time, I'm also not going to treat you like you're a kid. And I don't want you to think that I'm your parent. Because if that's the case, then we're gonna, we're gonna have a bad, a bad relation. So the stakes of how we shape what academic culture is are at stake. And we have, we have let, we have let um, the senior managers shape that culture for us. Now is the time for us to take it back if we're actually going to do anything to impact the kinds of anti-Black violences, anti-Indigenous violences that the university is at the center of. I want to say thank you, Dr. Walcott. Um, we are just about to come to a close of this session. I do want to recap on some of the key things um, that you pointed out. Um, you talked about um, unmaking the university by asking ourselves a fundamental question. What are we willing to risk? And what are we actually willing to do? Um, to pay attention to all of these dual use um, engagements, dual use technologies, um, and recognizing that, you know, when we talk about defunding the police, and I'm going to actually sum up with um, doing a little bit of a translation of what you spoke to, which is, if we're in the streets calling about defunding the police, why don't we defund the police in the academy? Why don't we defund the surveillance technology within the academy? Why don't we bring under question students that are seeking patents, whether we're engineering or in, in medicine like myself or other areas? Why don't we demand that there is some kind of intervention that prevents, as you talked about, being, us being trained and professors training students how to become the makers of tools, the wielder of tools that create the violence that the police and the state wields that eventually gets into the hands of quote, organized crime. We keep forgetting that crime gets its tools from us. We don't, you know, from the, from the state and from the governing bodies, that's where those quote tools, those guns, those um, piercing bullets, um, all of that technology comes from the military state, comes from the police, and then circulates, quote, to the so-called um, folks that they don't want to have it. And so maybe in part of that unmaking, in part of that imagining that you've pushed us to think about, and in part of becoming less complicit, maybe it's to not just govern the movements in the street or hear and reiterate the movements in the street, but initiate a new movement that is specific and exclusive to the academy, which is the defunding of all monies invested in a particular kind of surveillance, whether it's demands to have it on our computers through online courses or through the surveillance of the campus police who most often harass us as black and indigenous students. And that's a very long movement, but maybe it's time to add surveillance to it and add the direct question about how is the professor policing and how is the student being trained to become the academic and social police? Would that be a fair challenge to pose to all of the attendees online about what they can do to make the unmaking a reality? Fantastic. So on that note, folks, we are at five o'clock. We wanna say thank you very much for joining Two Crises of Virus and, a lab and Labor. We also wanna thank um, the closed captioner um, Megan Linton, uh, Protest Access and Critical Disability Studies, Idil Abdullahi at Ryerson University. Thank you for trying to keep up with this um, spirited discussion. Thank you everyone for your questions and please continue to strike back, push back and teach in. Be well, take care. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>